I'd like to welcome you to this series of lectures sponsored by Now You Know Media. And we shall ask during these discussions of ours, what can Teresa of Avila, saint and doctor of the church, teach us about prayer? I hope that this exploration of the life and writings of St. Teresa will bring us the kind of wisdom about prayer that she would want us to know. I would like to begin with a prayer to the Holy Spirit. I will later, in another topic, explain why it is that Teresa would be at home with that prayer. And so I invite you, many of you, all of you perhaps, will know the responses. And if you could say them with me as we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructed the hearts of your faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and every rejoice in your holy consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. This series, as you know, is called Teresa, Teach Us to Pray. And we're turning to that great Saint Teresa, oftentimes to distinguish her from Therese of Lisieux, she's referred to as the Great Teresa. Teresa of Avila was born in 1515 and died in 1582, soon declared a saint and was, in 1970, the first woman doctor of the church. She was, as you know, an extraordinary woman who captured the imagination of the people of her time and continues to fascinate those who search for God and those who seek to grow in prayer. What is central to Teresa's teaching about prayer is that it was for her a search for and discovery of God's lavish love, which I shall be returning to often during these topics. Teresa had a very outsized personality during a century when there were many outsized personalities. For example, Martin Luther, Ignatius of Loyola, Henry VIII, Thomas More, Michelangelo, earlier on Fernand and Isabella, and many, many more. It was an era in Spain called its Golden Age. Figures like El Greco and Cervantes with his Don Quixote. It was an age of great poetry and drama and music and painting. And there is a Teresa of Avila and her collaborator, John of the Cross, as well as Ignatius of Loyola. Among all of these was Teresa herself, self-made woman whom grace raised up to become a saint, and as I have just mentioned, the very first woman doctor of the church. She had a great personality. Teresa was warm, outgoing, affectionate, gregarious, energetic, single-minded, a faithful friend to so many, playful and endowed with a lively sense of humor that she so often turned on herself. The French theologian Louis Cognier noted the paradoxical characteristics of Teresa. These paradoxes make Teresa a very interesting figure for people of numerous faiths and traditions. She appeals across all lines of religion. Let me mention these paradoxes. Teresa was, in so many ways, introverted, and yet extroverted. She brought those together. She was an idealistic woman, but very practical a skillful administrator, and I might mention, and should be proud of this, a very good cook. The nuns in her monastery were happy when it was Teresa's turn in the kitchen. Teresa was firm, and at times she could be rigorous, but Teresa was ever so human. 
And Teresa wrote that God doesn't expect us to be, and this is a quotation, completely perfect. Consoling words to us all. In her interior castle, that quotation appears in the fifth dwelling places, third and seventh paragraph. To continue about Teresa's paradoxical characteristics, she was feminine to the core of her being, yet called by many, and even hinted at by her own, as in Spanish, varnil, manly, and that's for many men of the 16th century, that was the highest compliment they could pay this woman from Avila, who so transcended in many ways gender in her life. Moreover, Teresa was a single-minded woman who often repeated the need for her and for us to be, in Spanish, determinación determinada, a very determined determination. Let me say that I've extracted from that what Teresa wanted, Teresa got. Here is an example that Teresa could even be determined to get her way when addressing the Lord himself. At age 39, at the time of her first conversion, she wrote later, I think that I then said that I would not rise from there until he, God, granted what I was begging for. Strong words for a woman uh, who was addressing her Lord and God. Teresa was passionate, a woman of great desires. The Dominican Brian Davies has written in a book that has a, um, uh, the, the author as uh, Rowan Williams, a book called Teresa of Avila. Rowan Williams is, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury and has long been a devotee of Teresa. In the foreword to that book, Brian uh, Davies writes, Together with her contemporary, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila represents the highest point of Catholic spiritual writing in the troubled age of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. She is also one of the founding figures of modern Spanish literature. I want to pause for a moment and just go back and speak to the point of the paradoxical characteristics of Teresa. Most of us in our lives have a tendency to move to one side of the paradox or the other. Let me give an example of that for music. Music is not sound, but the creative tension between sound and silence. Same is true of friendship. Friendship is, is not just togetherness, it's togetherness and apartness, so that we, as we uh, consider Teresa, can be witnesses to these paradoxical aspirations of her personality, which makes her so interesting uh, a person. When Teresa is writing about herself in these times in which she lived, she says this, the world is all in flames. They want to sentence Christ again, so to speak, since they raise a thousand false witnesses against him. They want to ravish his church. And we, to waste time thinking about things about God, uh, at this time, we have other things to do. I'm paraphrasing right here. Uh, so she says in the end of that quotation, No, my sisters, this is not the time to be discussing with God matters of little importance. Teresa could be an impatient person. That quotation appears in the way of perfection in the first chapter, the fifth paragraph. Lots of things mattered to Teresa, and nothing more than her search for God in prayer. And prayer is that, for her and for us, a search for God in which God gradually reveals God's self and the truth 
of God and that wisdom Teresa found and passes on to us. In this turbulent days of uh, the 16th century, here are some aspects of her era to keep in mind as we turn to Teresa for wisdom about prayer. Teresa died at 67, but in that lifetime, which spanned a goodly portion of Spain's golden century, the Siglo de Oro, these are some characteristics that help explain who Teresa was, what she was searching for, and what she discovered. This age, the 16th century, and especially that part of it which Teresa lived in, was an age of discovery. Remember this, that the explorer Columbus first journeyed to the New World in 1492, 23 years before Teresa was born. While Columbus sailed west to the New World, Teresa explored the inner world, the spiritual terrain of the human family and person. A second point about this era, Teresa lived as an adult in an age of prosperity and affluence. Lots of gold and huge caches of precious metals flowed back from the Americas to the Iberian Peninsula during this time of discovery. And in that regard, I'd like to mention a theory about the history of mysticism that very often it flourishes in a time of affluence. That seems to happen because in a time of affluence, one has the opportunity to move from one place to another to discover wisdom that one couldn't find in the last place where one has been. And so in this age of affluence, there's a great interest in the inner life of the human person. And that would bring up the next point about this age. It was an age especially in Spain, but all of uh, Europe, there was a kind of illuminism, a, a, a interest, an intense interest in the life of the inner person. Uh, some on the fridge, fringe of Catholic tradition uh, lived there during this age, but also others who were quite orthodox. During this era, there was a huge interest in the spiritual life, in mysticism, and there was great interest in prayer especially contemplative prayer, as it was called at the time, the prayer of recollection. There was another form of the prayer of recollection, and that is the prayer of deyamen, or surrender, and more on this later. This age of Teresa, we might even call it, was an era in which the Spanish Inquisition had been inaugurated by Isabel and Ferdinand. And it is important for us to keep in mind that this Spanish Inquisition was Spanish, that it was contrived with a background of the Church's Inquisition, Roman Inquisition, but in Spain it had a political orientation. Teresa would lived in this age in which Isabel and Ferdinand had made this decision that they would bring about a national state, we would call it now, uh, made up of these many kingdoms that existed uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, that they contrived their inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, to help bring about a unified Iberian Peninsula. These inquisitors who were doing the work of the state were vigilant against any spread of Protestantism or any manifestation of what would be considered in our time deviant expressions of any kind. I want to mention that my own conviction is that both Teresa and John of the Cross did not spend much time worrying about the Inquisition. They were compliant. Uh, they didn't go out of the way to rub anybody's nose in the what would ever be thrown out there, but uh, they weren't going to defy the Inquisition. I think too much has been made 
of the impact of the Inquisition on John's writings and Teresa's writings.